You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. All right, how you doing? Hope you're all great, staying happy, and thanks for choosing to listen to my podcast, Straight to Video. Now, this will be my last podcast of my 40s, which is pretty scary as I turn 50 years old next week, so the next time we chat, I'll have hit a half century. Still not sure how I'm feeling about that. 30 and 40, they were fine, but this seems like a real big one. I guess the fun part of that which keeps me going, though, is that through this podcast, I get to speak to people who I was a fan of during my teenage years to keep those memories coming back, and today's chat is no different as I talk to uber-talented guitarist, musician, and songwriter extraordinaire Richie Kotzen. Richie has been a force in the music industry and rock world since the late 80s and 90s, first releasing solo albums on Shrapnel Records before landing the gig with Poison on their Native Tongue album, and since then he's racked up an incredible solo career, as well as being part of Mr. Big and more recently the Winery Dogs. Richie has one of the most soulful and unique voices in rock, and combined with his amazing guitar talent, he really is considered one of the finest out there. Right now he's getting set to release a brand new solo album at the end of the month called Nomad and heading out on a US tour which starts today, Friday the 13th of September if you're listening when this show goes out. We chat all about the record and tour along with some memories of his long career including his time in Poison which I think is such an interesting time frame in rock and roll and that particular band's legacy. Now as always this straight to video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, an incredible piece of photo editing software which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. Affinity is used to create the podcast episode artwork you see each week and it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market so please check them out at affinity.serif.com. All right let's dive into today's show. As mentioned the new Richie Cotson album Nomad is out at the end of September and all info including tour dates can be found at richiecotson.com. But right now please enjoy my straight to video chat with Richie Cotson. <laughs> Right. How's it going, sir? How are you doing? I'm good. Lovely to see you. All right. How's your day going? Is it a press blitz at the moment? Yeah, we've been doing a lot. Kicking off pretty early here, 9 a.m. Not too bad. Super early start. You got a full day of it. I think today is a light one. Well, I'll try and keep it as upbeat and as fresh as possible for you. All right, sounds good. So yeah, your brand new album, Nomad, is out on September the 27th, along with a big US tour. How's the anticipation for you in today's world when it comes to new album releases? Do you get nervous, excited, or is it hard to judge with a lot of things being digitally based now? Yeah, you know, I guess it's not what you'd think, only because from my side, of it that music has existed now for quite some time so you know when you make an album you make the thing that it's gonna be there for quite a while until all the components line up to where you're releasing it so i don't listen to the work regularly so i should probably go back and give the whole thing a good listen because you know i'm a little removed from it i'm talking about it of course so uh, we did make some video clips so at that point i went back and listened to what i did and i feel the same way now about it as i did when I made it. You know, obviously, you never make a record and say, this is the worst thing I've ever done. Check it out. You always think that it's the best thing you've ever done. Check it out. So I feel that way. I'm very excited about it, you know, sharing it. you got to be right in the middle of a tour when the album's released. Yeah. I think your tour starts at the Coach House in San Juan Capistrano. I think I pronounced that right because I played there a few years ago. That's a really cool venue, man. Is that the one with like, all the tables right up to the stage? Yeah, they do. All the photos on the walls and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny the first time i ever played there i actually was nervous because the setup made me feel exposed because that stage is just out there whereas most of the venues i'm used to the stage is back you know what i mean so there's this full open side view for the whole venue and so for whatever reason this is a long time ago that just kind of tweaked me a little bit made me feel a bit self-conscious and then the next time i played there i had a great crowd and they were loud and excited and after that i was like all right put me in you know <laughs> <laughs> now I, I always look forward to having a gig there and you know it's a few hours down the road so it's not too far it's kind of a, a local gig so to speak so it's a good one a nice starting point yeah i think you'll be in omaha nebraska on the album's release day of september 27th any album 
album release day planned? Initially, you know, when I did this, I thought, well, maybe the whiskey in LA would have been a great place to do that, you know, being that I live here. But reality is the vinyl wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be ready. And so uh, Omaha, Nebraska. The album is going to be out on vinyl too, which is like really cool. I mean, you've worked with like big labels and done things independently. And so how easy is it for you to get albums stocked in record stores? Is that a priority to you these days? Is that cool for you? That's a thought that hasn't crossed my mind in 20 years. Is it in the record store? I don't know. I wouldn't even know where to go to go. I, mean, well, I do know where to go, obviously, in LA, but it's not like you know, Tower Records isn't operating. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think of any of that. I don't think of any of that stuff. None of the outside stuff. I just make the music and make sure it sounds like what I want it to sound like. That's my main priority. And if someone takes my picture, I, I make sure that, you know, it looks somewhat how I perceive myself. But beyond that, I don't, you know, that's for the record company to let them do their job. Saying that though, do you remember any anticipation for a particular album you had growing up as a fan where you couldn't wait for it to be released and maybe going to the store to buy it? I don't really remember that as much, but what I do remember specifically is my first record came out in 1989 and that's when the CDs were happening. And the rumor was that my record would not be printed in vinyl because they were fading out vinyl, no more vinyl. And I remember being in a panic because obviously I wanted an album. I got a record deal. I, I made an album. I was 18, very excited. In the end, it did get made in vinyl. But there was this talk of, well, it might have got in too late. You know, that was the attitude. And I was thinking, oh, my, come on, man. What do you mean too late? I'm going to get it on cassette. <laughs> You had it on cassette, yeah. yeah. I missed the 8-track phenomenon, that, that I missed out on. The new record is huge on the bass sound, which I know is always important for you. Where does your love of what the bass brings to the sound come from? Because we grew up in an age of rock records, especially towards the end of the 80s, when the bass seemed to get lost in the mix quite a bit. Yeah, and I don't know why. I mean, you know, it's something that always, it's very weird when you hear an album and like the bass is this kind of weird, invisible ghost that you, know, you kind of feel it. You think it's there, but really no. And the records that I listened to, you heard the bass. For whatever reason, that instrument is a big part of my music. When I write, it's super important. And that's why I usually play it myself, because I'm not someone that is, you know, oh, give me the bass, I'll just play something. In my mind, I take it seriously. And it's written, it's orchestrated. There's certain parts that need to happen in order for the composition to play correctly. And, you know, there's not a lot of instrumentation in my music. You know, it's bass, drums, guitar, vocal. Occasionally, I'll set the organ up piano here and there so i want to hear it i want to hear the instruments I, I think that's pretty normal but you know i do have a certain kind of sensibility for sly and the family stone larry graham stevie wonder you know was it nate watts you know first concert ever stevie wonder so first album that i came obsessed with was talking book obviously maybe your baby is one of the most epic bass songs if there's keyboard bass in that I think there's both, actually, if I remember correct. But the best concert I ever saw in my life was Bootsy Collins at the House of Blues in L.A. Wow, what year was that? Had to have been early on in the House of Blues existence, because I went to the opening of it in 94. So it had to be shortly after that. And I remember Lenny Kravitz got up and sat in, which was great. But I remember that concert being like, wow, that, that was a show. Did it catch you off guard? I mean, you was probably anticipating it being good, but did it catch you off guard at how good it was? I knew I was going to enjoy it. I just didn't know that. I, you know, a lot of times you go to a concert and even with someone you like, you know, you're in there and you're sitting there and the seat gets a little uncomfortable and people around you become a little obnoxious. And then suddenly you're like, all right, when's the last song? You know what I mean? <laughs> and so that certainly did not happen for me on that show. Speaking of the bass on your album, tracks like Nomad, the bass is right up there, and particularly Insomnia, which I think you've said you had four basses. Yeah, there's four basses on Insomnia, but it's not like it's you know mayhem where everybody's kind of going nuts. It's orchestrated. So there's a main bass guitar, and then certain lines I would double an octave higher. And then there's two different keyboard basses that play at two different points in the song. So it's orchestrated. It's not like, you know, handed everybody a bass and said, go crazy. When did you come up with double tracking with like the octave? Was that something you've done for a long time? Yeah, I've done that for a real long time. I don't know that I saw someone do it, but I probably heard it. You know, I mean, I know Stanley Clark plays that piccolo bass. I'm sure he does it. I probably heard him do it on one of his records when I was a kid. One thing I did get from Stanley, and you hear it in Insomnia, and I've 
done it ever since. We were with a band together called Vertu. He wrote most of the music, but I did write this one song called Start It Again. And he played bass synth on something. And he did this trick where he went over and went, bam, and striked the keys all the way from top to bottom. And it made this cool sound like, you know, like a laser or something. So I always loved that. So you can hear that in insomnia going into the chorus. You know, I walk over to the Korg and just write down the bam. And it makes like a really cool impact sound. So that I did get from him. I remember him doing that. I thought, that's cool. I'm going to do that. When it comes to performing the songs live, you've been playing with bassist Dylan Wilson in your solo band for a long time. Yeah. How did the two of you hook up? I met him through the drummer that I was playing with in the band. And so the bass player that was in there went off and needed a bass player. So he recommended Dylan. Dylan came in and knew all the songs, you know, had everything right. You know, one thing that drives me nuts is when a guy comes in and has paper. Because in my mind, my songs are not really on the paper. Because the lyrics and the melodies, and I feel like if you're going to play it, you should know the composition, which is not just knowing the beat and when you hit the crash cymbal. And that's something that always just put me off. A guy comes in like, well, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. So when Dylan came in, he didn't have any paper. He just played the music. And it sounded great. And then he and I have evolved into something really fun. And I think something very special when you see the band live. How does he approach the new material? Do you send him the bass tracks or does he just have a great ear to pick out the parts? He has a great ear. And then, you know, he'll ask me, what are you doing there? Because I can't quite discern because you've got a guitar on top of it or you're singing something. And the problem is when a musician comes up with these lines, a lot of times it's kind of, how do I say, conducive to how they finger things and how they play. You know, and I noticed this even with the winery dogs, Billy would come up with a line and I would have to double it. Or I would come up with a line like in the song, We Are One, that song, I had that track pretty much ready. And I had that lick in there that we play. It's like a triplet thing. And he had to learn to finger it completely differently. And it still sounded cool and it matched up and it worked. So when I show Dylan something, you know, it sometimes takes a minute and I show him, well, this is how I'm fingering it because it seems easy to do this. You know, it's a little bit of a going over it type situation. It's a great guitar album, big band album, but the song that floored me was This Is A Test, which just guitar and vocal. Did I hear you recorded that on the original guitar? Was it your grandfather that gave you when you were super young? Yeah, he moved to America, you know, when he was 16 from Italy. And he used to sing Italian folk songs to my mom, according to her. And this was the guitar that he played. And I have it. And I've used it before. I used it on a couple things in the past. But on this one, I thought it would be appropriate. That song was written in a very interesting way. I was setting up my computer to go on a trip. And I wanted to be able to record my ideas and get my songs going. And so I was testing the system. I plugged a guitar in. I had a microphone. And I was playing the chords. And I started singing a melody. And I recorded it because I wanted to make sure that it was going to track what I was doing. And then every now and then when I was playing, I'd say, this is a test. This is a test. And I play it back and listen to it. And I think that's more than a test. That's a song, you know. That's a hook right there. Yeah, that's what I thought. And so I started listening closer. And, you know, sometimes you kind of sing a line or two. And I, I wrote it down. Well, it sounds like I said something about a rose. I'll write that down. And then in the end, I sat back and I thought, well, what can I come up with in your story? So I conjured up some sort of story. And then I wrote about it. Did you change the strings on the guitar, though? Or are they ones which have been on there forever? Oh, well, yeah, they've been changed because the guitar was actually damaged. There was part of it that had to be glued back together. I can't tell where it was. It looks perfect. But what was tricky is keeping it in tune. I'd get through a certain section, then it would be completely whacked. So then I had to deal with that, which was unpleasant because it just makes something that should happen very simply and easy and quick. It makes it a, a nightmare. What a journey for that guitar, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think it was ever in Italy. I think he purchased it in New York, probably. But anyway, nonetheless. You're a musician to me who has always seemed incredibly comfortable in their own skin. From the outside looking in, you always appear to have been like incredibly honest with the choices you've made. Can't imagine there's many projects or even an image where you've thought that was a weird choice. I don't know if that's true or not. No, you know, because at the moment, anytime I would do something, it made sense to do it. There were some things that were effed up that happened. Like, I'll tell you, things like this that are, always have to do with nothing to do with music. I had a record called Wave of Emotion. I had never in my life had an intention of making an album with the title Wave of Emotion. I wouldn't have done that because I don't think that's an appropriate title for me. 
for a song, yes, it is a song. I co-wrote a song, and that was the name of the song. And that song went on the album, and they decided that should be the first single. So the album was going to be called Degeneration. And I was standing in front, and I used the same picture, standing in front of a facility in Los Angeles that had some smokestacks on it. It's a really cool picture. I'm kind of standing there. It's kind of stylized. And it was going to be called Degeneration. And so my manager at the time convinced me that the label in Japan thought it would be offensive to have the album called Degeneration with me standing in front of smokestacks. And I, for the life of me, couldn't put the math together of what was offensive about that. And he was trying to tie it into, you know, some bad happenings. And I was like, you're really reaching here. This is really... You're overthinking this. Oh, big time. Another thing that happened that I should be drawing light on this, but you know, people probably wonder, why does this exist? There's another one. I sold some master rights in the 90s. Somehow these rights ended up with a company in Germany. They decided to take the four albums and selectively take songs that they wanted to take and put it on a compilation record. Well, they named the record I'm Coming Out. So that means that, you know, for some people, you're coming out of the closet. Now, you know, I've always been straight myself, married, married before. So I don't go that way. Now, that is a weird choice of a title. And the reason, the reason why is there's a song on the album called Coming Out, which is a straight up gambling song. It's about shooting dice. And Dice World, the first role of the game is the come out role. And so somewhere, I think the song might be called Coming Out. And if you listen to the song, clearly I'm talking about playing dice, shooting craps. And so that's out there, you know? So, and those are the kinds of things that when you don't have the right group of people working for you, you end up in these very bizarre scenarios. So nothing that I did deliberately do I feel like, oh, that might've been a bad idea. But people around me have definitely done things with my name that I'm not so fond of. Crazy. Because I love the 40 Deuce album, which I think gets overlooked. Oh, yeah. A lot of people don't know about that. I was out in um, Hollywood in 2005, and me and my wife went to see Steel Panther or Metal Shop or Metal School, what it was called at the time. And uh, yeah. we got into the Roxy and we were getting tickets, and I could hear the opening band, and I was like, I know that voice. Oh, it's us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I had that album for review in my old fanzine back in like the early 2000s and loved it. That seems like yesterday and it was so long ago, wasn't it? Great album, man. Great album. I love it. Yeah, that is a really cool album. We had a lot of fun making that. And I saw you on tour with Poison in the UK back in 1993. I mean, Poison were an important band for me. They were actually the band that made me want to be in a band. So cool. right there, you were such a great fit in my eyes. Flesh and Blood was the big album for me. So when you came along, it was this like natural progression in both sound and image. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved how you fit into that dynamic. Well, I think that what happened there is that I was actually signed to a major recording contract before that. I was never looking to join someone's band. And the contract went south because I wouldn't agree stylistically with what kind of record I wanted to make with the label. So I insisted they drop me and they did. So it was a pretty bold move. Maybe it was a little stupid on my part, but that's what I did. And at the time, Brett Michaels was interested in meeting me because he had seen me on the cover of one of the guitar magazines. And so when I went to his house, he said, hey, you know, we want a writer in the band, not a guy just to do what I tell him. But once I realized that we had quite a bit in common with the music, then it made sense. So we made a record and you saw the gig. <laughs> it was awesome, man. It was awesome. Was the Native Tongue album the first time you'd recorded in like an equal full band environment sort of thing? Because you'd done your solo albums on Shrapnel before then? No, when the Shrapnel records, when I did that, I mean, you know, Atma Anur was playing drums. I had a buddy of mine playing bass. So no, it was similar. But the big difference... The major difference was a shrapnel record. They probably try to get you in and out of there 20 or 30 grand, where budget for that poison record was two and a half million. So we fucked off a lot. I mean, they had a ping pong table in there. I remember playing ping pong with the bass player. He and I were just addicted to it and gambling, you know, it was fucking got dark a couple of times. You know, I was on the line like, fuck. 50 grand in debt just for the fucking ping pong to the bass player. This ain't going to work. <laughs> I love that. I played my way out of it, though. I did. You're not going to beat me. Was that Poison Tour your first time in the UK? Well, Poison was what led me to the UK for the first time because Brett and I flew to England to do a press tour. And then we came back for the show. So that was the first time I performed. And you know, I was sick. No one knows that. But on that show, they filmed that Hammersmith show. 
my ear was closed. I don't know what happened to me, but the ear would not open. It was horrible to hear music that way. It was just crazy. And then they said, I went to a doctor in London and he said, don't fly home. He said, you fly home, you might rupture your eardrum. I said, we we're going to play the Tonight Show in a week. I have to fly home. Fuck it. And I flew home and I did the Tonight Show with this closed ear, Jay Leno show. And then somehow I went to Edward Cantor, who was my doctor, and he did some crazy shit and it opened. He opened it up. That must be scary, though, at that point of your career. Like, still super young and things are really on the open. Then something like that happens. Oh, yeah. It was, it was unpleasant. <laughs> You've been over here countless times and recently just back from a European tour. Do you have any favorite places you like to go to now or is there anything you still to do, like still on the checklist? I love being in London. I mean, I love playing there and it's a beautiful city and a great place to go. And the tour was great. We ended there, which was a great place to have the last run. That was a very busy day for me. But um, it was great. That was a great run. We did some festivals. Extreme was out there, so they let me open up a couple shows for them. Sweet. ZZ Top had me on a show opening up. That was fun. Played the Sweden Rock Festival. Played a gig with Glenn Hughes. So it was, it was a great run. Really good. Really fun. Just to wrap things up, Rich, because I don't want to keep you too long. A lot of your early career was through the unpredictable and weird musical climate that was the 1990s. But I think you're a big fan of the first Oasis album. What's your thoughts on the Brothers reunion? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. I mean, uh, that's really great. The pictures I'm seeing, are they old photographs or are they new photographs? They're new photographs, I think. The black and white ones, which are coming up. All right. Guys didn't age. Apparently, they didn't get old. They look cooler now than they did back in the day. Yeah, they look good. Yeah, no, I'm going to go. I don't go to a lot of shows. I went and saw Sammy Hagar and Joe Satriani, Michael Anthony, and Jason Bonham. Oh, I'd love to see that show, man. That was fucking great. Oh, Mike is my guy. I love him. All those guys were just fantastic. That was a great, great, great show. So that I haven't been to a show like that in a long time. I think the last time I went to the Forum, I saw the Eagles, which is my favorite band. But I'll go see Oasis for sure. That would be great. Well, I want to wish you all the best with the new album, Nomad, when it's out in a couple of weeks. And have a great time on on tour. I'm sure it'll go down a storm. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Massive thank you to Richie Cotterson for chatting with me on the Straight to Video podcast. Kind of would have loved more time to deep dive into his amazing journey, but as he's right in the middle of album promo, then it was short and sweet, but still a lot of fun. Be sure to check out the album Nomad when it's released later this month, but also why not have a listen to the awesome 40 Deuce record, which you spoke about, as that's a bit of a monster. Everything else you need to know can be found at richiecotson.com. So that's it for this week's episode of the podcast. So until we chat again in my 50s, make sure to always be kind. Please rewind and unwind and I'll speak to you all real soon. Bye.